So I want to know all about your childhood. Where did you Where did you grow up? Did you grow up here? I grew up right here in Montgomery, Alabama. I lived here all my life, um, except for a few years away, uh, and came right back to the same house I was born in. I live in that same house. I love that community, Mobile Heights community, so much. And then, uh, and I'm going to get to my childhood, but then I started working with Mercy House because um, Mercy House went to my old community in Washington Park. So I grew up on Beecher Street in Washington Park with my grandmother, and my mother lived there at some point as well. And I grew up in Mobile Heights with my father, who was, um, you know, my father and I, we were there. Um, so it was, it was those two communities where I grew up. I went to Carver Elementary School, Carver High School. I finished at Carver High School. Um, and so I just want to tell you how delightful my childhood was. Even though there were so many things going wrong, there were many going right. And so uh, the way I grew up, my father gave me a lot of culture for what we can consider as culture. I spent a lot of time with him. I came downtown with him every other week to shop at H.L. Green. Uh, and now it's, it's a, a clothing store. But the way my father taught me is why I have the life I have now. And the one thing we were talking earlier about uh, this place being so complacent, but the one thing I always remember, uh, I would come downtown with my father and he would he would take me to all the little parades or whatever, but we stood back, you know, we didn't stand in the crowds. And I would always say, I, I want to go closer. I want to, I want to see. He said, we are doing fine just where we are. That became the theme of our lives. We are doing fine just where we are. And my father was a, a nurse's assistant at the VA. So when we talk about, well, a lot of them didn't get involved, right? We know that those uh, who had jobs, they, they probably were not going to jeopardize anything, and that's the way my father was. And he felt like we were doing fine just the way we are. He had been in the military, and of course, uh, that old neighborhood where I am now was called Veterans Court. And, and so it, uh, then of course, it moved on to Mobile Heights, all right? But to get back to my father, uh, we would take a trip to Mobile, uh, visit relatives. Uh, we, we've always had a car, you know. Did you find there were any differences between Mobile and Montgomery as far as segregation? Do you remember segregation? Later? I do remember segregation because uh, that's that's the way we lived, and and so Mobile was the same. Uh, it was the same all over the state of Alabama. Uh, but when we visit relatives, uh, he mainly went there to go fish, fishing for maybe three uh, three days. So we had little vacations. And then when we came back, like I said, he taught me great lessons, but he was a quiet man. And he didn't want to trouble anyone. He didn't want to trouble the waters. And, and so then if I talk about my mother, uh, because my mother and father were divorced, she, my mother lived in a little shotgun house right across from my grandmother. And so when I when I was with her, I heard stories and, and, and she was a great teacher. So I had a wonderful, just a wonderful life with my mom, my dad, and then my grandmother was a true businesswoman. My grandmother was more radical. My grandmother loved Dr. Martin Luther King. My grandmother, um, when, when she went to churches, she loved the fact that they had started teaching writing. Now, I used to write letters for my grandmother. All the sisters except my mother moved away. 
during the Great Migration, okay? But because I love Beecher Street because my grandmother lived in the big greenhouse. On the other side of her was one of uh, the um, her, her daughters, and, and uh, on the other side was a son, and the back was Uncle John. So they all had houses right in there, all right? So we grew up, and I always thought we were rich, and I, I got at least, my dad would always give me 15 cents a day, 15 cents. And so I was, thought I was doing okay. And my dad would always say, we're doing fine, just where we are. And um, so, but my grandmother taught me how to be business minded. She um, ran a boarding house. Now, when we think of boarding house, what do you think of? But her boarding house with these nice young ladies from the uh, country, Lowndes County, they came up to get jobs at Bell South, and she would rent the rooms to the young ladies. And until they got married, and they moved on. Uh, so I learned how to share with other people. Um, then going through high school, I think I was more uh, like a hitting, uh, not very popular, but held my own. And, and we had the best time at Calder High School where culture was a part of everything. The thing. Really? Yes. We had a wonderful time at Carver High School. And that's why even now, I advocate for vocational studies uh, to come back because I've noticed, um, now, let me just say this. Back then, the counselor would probably say, oh, you're not college material, you're not college material, okay? And that put a stigma on vocational um, aspect of anything. I'm being older now, and I look back at all the things that have happened, and we are turning and we're coming back to some of the things that really work. But see, Coffrey was a community school, as was Booker T. Washington, a community school. And they closed Booker T. Washington down, said, we don't have money to repair it, and we're going to send those children over to Lee, uh, where Coffrey's uh, maintained. We were a close community. Um, and so, yeah. So did you? So you did learn about um, a lot of the obstacles that people of color had to overcome at Carver. Not only that, but we knew what they were. We knew the obstacles because we were going through that ourselves. That's so different from it is today. Uh, and the reason for that is that there's a little story where uh, a person says. We struggled, okay? And when we got enough, we didn't want our children to struggle. We didn't even want them to know about the struggle. So as they grew up, they didn't have to know about it. They didn't have to, uh, really they didn't learn about it. We didn't talk that much about it. And, and as they grew up, they didn't understand what it took. Therefore, me, as soon as I got 17, I wanted to register to vote. That was so, so, so important to me. Whereas I was a part of the struggle. I knew what it took. Then as the next generation came along, they had no idea. They, don't, they didn't know how important that was. Uh, really, they didn't care because um, they see the same politicians. Now, then we gave our children so much, so much more than we have. So a lot of times you don't know where that comes from. Now the struggle comes back and they are going to have to realize at some point that, you know, now I need to take charge. I need to become more accountable. And it only happens um, when you have to go through different things. And, and so that's why I said here in Montgomery, Alabama, yeah, we knew all about it. And to get back to this day, when on this side of the bridge, when the march came through, we stood there, these children. This was in a yearbook. Somebody snapped a picture. And so we, I took this from that Carver yearbook that year. 
and I would have been maybe seventh or eighth grade. And our teachers allowed us to go out and uh, allowed us to go out and watch in amazement the crowds coming through. All the boys, this is what I heard, all the boys ran and jumped in um, that, that march. And many, many other girls. And then the ones standing here, we remember my father. And, and there are a couple more. I've had relatives, you know, the George March as well. But um, uh, uh, the few of us, we remember what our parents said. Don't you join that march. You're doing fine the way you are. Now, um, I looked over and I would see my future husband in that march. And he was the one who led those marches. As a matter of fact, as they tell the stories, uh, you hear some of them say, oh, that Richard Boone came through uh, St. Jude, the Catholic school. And the sister said, what are you waiting for? You go join that march. What are you waiting for? The, the teachers who were there, I like to say, well, I was there with my teacher, Miss Bray. Miss Bray worked in my community around the street for me. And I guess I was sitting there for Miss Bray. But I think Miss Bray was real proud that most people went to the march, okay? I really think she was. Because she didn't go. She didn't want to lose her job. And, and so that's the type of story. All of these people here, I kind of know them even now. And most of them are here. And they're teachers. Or <laughs> uh, one of them, uh, Claudia, uh, Claudia Mitchell, uh, she's on the school board now. So what I'm saying to you, uh, that march came through, but something else happened to us. We had a consciousness as well, and we would do, uh, in our own way, we would do things that we needed to do to make this place a lot better. Then that brings up um, Dr. Van McClenney. Uh, he's passed last year, but I talked to him all, all the time, you know, especially when I was trying to get history right. And so I asked him about the march as well. And, and as I asked different people who didn't go, he said to me, well, you know, I had a young family during that time. But let me tell you what he did as a young man. Now, my husband, they, they were friends, as a matter of fact. Um, now, my husband did that and stayed with civil rights. His consciousness took him another way, and he did economic development. And as a young man, about the same age as my husband, leading marches and protests, he went to New York with a brochure that he had done. And he came back with means to invest in that same little community over where my husband led a march down there. And, and, and he, that little place where um, the 800 people who came from Montgomery met on this little spot there. And the communities out there, Greater Washington Park came out, gave out little sandwiches and cups of water and, and did what they could do for the marchers. Okay, so that space later became Young Fort Village and or Cedar Park, ended up being Cedar Park, a project area. Why? Because of the consciousness that was brought on by one march and by one uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. We call him the King's Men. And um, so I can go back to my childhood. We had, um, I was the, like a sponsor in, in the ROTC because girls could not be in the ROTC. This was before the titles. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was, it, my friends and I decided we'd be sponsors and I was like the rightful person, you know, you're the, uh, the sponsor for the rifle team. And you couldn't wear pants. You know, we didn't wear pants in school back then. So we had these little short dresses. I never understood that. We could wear these little short dresses, but we couldn't wear pants. Well, by the time I went to technical, and I did go to Trinidad for maybe a year, and then I went to work. But by the time we got there, I think it was 
Pat Nixon, the president's wife, wore pantsuit, and we were all told we could wear pantsuits. So I'm just telling you how the culture around us uh, affected how we were behind the scenes. And Frank Johnson uh, had said that, yes, we're going to allow you to march for five days only. So the second march, they went to the bridge, they prayed. The next week was the third march. And the third march, that's when my husband was more uh, a part of that because he, he was on this side of the bridge organizing young people. They were all young at that time, organizing young people. And so he organized over 800 students that going into high school. Well, 800? 800, 800, over 800. And so students from Tuskegee came from Alabama State, from all of the schools. Mm -hmm. that, that brings why this shirt, because I'm one of these little girls standing on the side. Of, wow. uh, because my, my teachers let us out and we're standing there watching the marches come you back. Now, of course, my, my husband worked with Dr. King and all of them uh, from Selma. And he worked on the Bevel side, James Bevel. James Bevel had a tragic ending, but uh, when they were young, they all worked together, and, they, and he was with Bevel on the Bevel side. And so, uh, when it when the SCLC was organized, Bevel and King uh, were they had the same decision making powers. So um, my husband on the side, and then of course King is now in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so these people, young people, went to sell to start a movement. Our teachers had already tried to vote. Uh, and so they all went to sell. My husband was in the background, you know, like logistics. And how did uh, Lewis, that day, it was Lewis time to uh, do the march. You know, he was the leader of the march. But they had different people every day leading the marches, okay? And so they tossed the coin to say, who's gonna lead the march this time? And it was John Lewis. And so because of that, when John Lewis went to Atlanta uh, to be a part of the SCLC, people rewarded him for being so courageous all those many years. And, and then he became a congressman from Georgia, all right? And then of course, uh, my husband did logistics. Like I said, these young people, nothing but young people making that decision that we want to change the settings here. Now, let's go back for a minute before this third march. Let's go back because a lot of times, um, young people don't know what happened. Why in the world were they marching? Well, Bevel and Boone would sit in my living room all the time and they would discuss and talk about all the things that they did, you know, back then. Um, they, James Orange, Reverend James Orange, mm -hmm. had been arrested because he was leading marches in Marion and places, Utah, and so uh, he had been arrested. Okay, they got work, the people got word that um, James Orange, um, people were gonna come and take him out of jail, which they've done so many times before in Um uh, So this was a night march and they were all there to really protect him. So the chain reaction is uh, the officer, police officers, this is the way I explain things to third graders. And then the officers were there and they wanted to break up um, the protesters. And when they went to break them up, um, they started on an elderly person. Mm -hmm. Now there are many different kinds of story about that. And so Jimmy Lee Jackson was protecting his mom. He's the one who got shot. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So, but you know the background now. They were there for James Orange uh, because they really thought he was going to be lynched. Yeah. And it ended up Jimmy Jackson was uh, shot and killed. Mm -hmm. It took one week before he died. And so it was, they were devastated. 
um, because the young male was a deacon and all of that, they were just devastated. And um, Bevel said, and he was a rebel, you know, rebel, he, he, we got to check his body and we're going to put it on the steps of Capitol. Mm -hmm. And he often said that, you know, they're all excited, they're all angry, and then they decided that they were going to go home and, and they'll come back with a better plan. And that's when they will say, we do not take it to the Capitol, but we're going to go and see that governor and, and let him know we're tired of this type of treatment. And that's how the Selma to Montgomery March came up. Now, James Bevel didn't get the credit uh, he deserved. He and his wife uh, started so many of the marches. They did the one in Birmingham. Uh, King didn't want to do that one because he said, no, we're not going to use little children, you know. And so um, they ended up saying parents are not going to march because they are afraid of, of losing their jobs. And the only choice we have is to have children to do that. And children were willing, and they told them, you know, so many going to go in and get arrested, so many going to go in and get arrested. But the way Bella tells his story, when he's sitting down in the living room, you know, and, and then um, we go over to the sheriff and say, now, we, we, we got to stop sending them for a minute. You want to take a break? We're going to take a break. You know, so the movement was this type of thing where uh, everyone understood that we will go to jail we're going to organize or whatever you say, we are going to go on and do that. We're going to keep coming, keep coming and fill the jails up as an expression of how we feel. All right. So that's, and, it, and this movement though, uh, that's a little different from any other movement, was a uh, peace power and uh, coming from a love standpoint, mm -hmm. a non-violent standpoint. That's why anytime you have a movement like that, Everyone listens and look and they go, even if they're not going to participate, they're going to be influenced by what goes on. And even King said when he lived here, okay, they burned the house, but we are not going to give a valid force to anyone because we are, this movement is bigger than any of them. King also said uh, when one of the women, like if you saw Selma, uh, the woman who went and slapped the man because the sheriff hit her and knocked her down. And uh, King said, no, stop. Uh, she, you know, when he went to arrest her, everybody getting all upset. He said, no, stop. We are not going to do that. We are going to maintain. Why did they listen to him? Because he had been through the same thing already. This place had been bombed. His wife and child had been there. So, of course, they listened and said, okay. You know, this is a movement of nonviolence. We are not going to give that up because if we do, then the whole movement is lost. Think about all the movements that are lost because of the violence. Sure, you would say, or I'll say, oh yeah, they had a right to do that because, um, you know, that was that was so bad what happened to that young man. But any movement that survived is a movement of love. It will transform every person around you, even if they say not one word. You always should know that right. Mm -hmm. You should know that first march, what happened there. You should know the second march, what happened there. A lot of people don't even know there were three marches. I did it. Okay. So it's, it's very important because those marches taught us textbook um, the way it should be done. Those three marches taught us how to continue to plan uh, with one another. And the fact that if you don't plan with love in mind, if you have something else in mind, then of course it's, it's not going to work very well. Mm -hmm. why, do you, why do you think that protests that people have in Montgomery now, they're not very effective, like nobody shows up for them? Do you think it has to do with people being afraid of losing their jobs or? Okay. It's, it, it's so different now. Well, the protests that they involve all, everyone, 
mainly because they all had something to lose or they had lost so much anyway, and it affected everyone around them. Whereas the protest today uh, is a moment, okay? You're upset for a moment. Back then, they were not, the churches, everything, the whole community was involved. They were not upset for a moment. It was like a lifetime of struggles, okay? It, it was not, oh, I'm going to react to uh, this that happened yesterday, like in my neighborhood when Fred Gunn was shot down. Oh, we're going to react because that happened, and, and now we, we're going to take all our frustrations out on uh, whatever's going on. But... If you are in a struggle, you don't take all your frustrations out in one day. You continue day after day. So that's what that movement was all about. There were people there. Um, SCLC was um, like any organization. They were on the ground. They were foot soldiers on the ground. Uh, when my husband moved here um, to, to do anything in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, it was his organization of people walking door to door, talking to people. Um, a lot of times when you have a little movement now, uh, you might put it on Facebook, you might call your friends, but it's not a movement where you're connecting your neighbors. You're gonna, when you get there, it's gonna be somebody from over here and over there. It's not gonna be all of your neighbors right there together. So we all had the same pain and, and the same neighbors and, and therefore they all came together because of that. And that's why uh, a movement would not work unless it's all of your neighbors there. Yeah, well, we, we, we are to a certain extent, but doesn't art bring a community together? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. yes. 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 I noticed that. Well, and then I'm not an artist. I can't do sick people even. I'm not an artist in that way. But I um, kind of notice what really attracts people and, and bring them together. And anytime you you put up a statue and, and all kinds of people write little checks and go, we want that there so we can tell that particular story. And so I noticed that art will do that for us. Not only was uh, Reverend Richard Boone an activist, a voting rights activist, but in this city, Montgomery, Alabama, he did feasibility studies and he went house to house asking people what they needed. When they realized that Johnson had passed the law for food stamps, this committee, the Alabama Action Committee with Reverend Boone, went to the commissioner several times in order to get food stamps for his people. And later on, when they did get the food stamp, he was known as the food stamp man. This is the last day of this uh, display. Okay. It has been up a whole year. My good friend, Ernestine Woods of Have a Heart. That child has been in Africa everywhere building stuff and she came and she put this up and she wanted people to understand the civil rights movement, foot soldier, a foot soldier's wife, the little girl here. It's really supposed to be Cheyenne Blair Priceberg, the smallest civil rights person. Cheyenne is now uh, doing great things around here in Montgomery, Alabama. And then she found a picture. I don't know if, if Ernestine went and, and talked to the mayor's mom. She found a picture of the mayor when he was in fourth grade. And she put him in front to let us know, all right, we have good soldiers, and look, as a result of voting, we have a new mayor in the city. He was so pleased to see a little fourth grader say, one day I can be made.
This picture is of uh, young people praying outside of the hospital for uh, the shepherd who had run. Young people out of town. Uh, the protests continued. He had run them out of town. And now he said that he had a heart. Something's wrong with his heart. And he was in the hospital. The shepherd, Jim Clark, is in the hospital. They are all outside the hospital praying for him. And he had a gym. And my husband would say, even when I'm dead and gone, if uh, Mother Boynton come to Montgomery, if she's here for any reason, we go see her. I would sit in her. Who's the little black person there? Uh, maybe the Boynton Robinson was uh, the organizer, who just did everything for herself. Uh, she was, uh, and then you're going to look her out now, for sure. <laughs> but, uh, she had worked for um, the Schiller Institute after Dr. King passed away. And so that was a more dressing on the Schiller Institute laws. And, and many people, Sean heard on, um, had well, rights already did for class, Sean heard because of her commitment to the Schiller Institute. And so all of her life in Selma and Tuskegee, um, she worked. She loved people. Every kind of person was always in her home. In her home. All right? And then she graduated from the city. Uh, and so when I sat with her, she would tell me all about Dr. George Washington Carr, who <laughs> was her teacher. Wow. And yeah. So see, when I talk to the children, yeah. So I, and, and as a matter of fact, she told me, she said, well, you know, we made my granddaughter call her. And because all oh, we love Dr. Carl so much. As we walk around, this was the last day uh, that I was telling you about what I did my my march um, right after my husband passed away. And of course, that's his hand on the, the wall. Something ourselves and represent as well. Because I think uh, a lot of times you think, well, no, I can't do that. But think about the people who did run back, the first person to do things. Um, and they didn't necessarily have to have a college education or, you know, go, have gone to train them or taken a few courses at the University of Alabama like I'm doing late in my life. But you have to have a, a spirit for your community. The beloved community belongs to all of us. And if you can just look around you and see something that needs to be changed in your heart, then you know you need to represent us in that capacity. Yes. So that's why I think it's full circle, coming back around. Any of us can serve because it's within us.